All right. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. I'm going to be your moderator. My name is Candice Coughlin, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Center for Living Organ Donation at the Ajmer Transplant Center at UHN. And uh, our goal at the center is to improve access to living organ donation for people who need life-saving kidney and liver transplants and those who want to give that gift of life. And we recently launched a beautiful campaign called Great Actions Leave a Mark that showcases living kidney and liver donors and recipients showing their scars and sharing their journeys. So I encourage all of you to take a look at greatactions.ca. Tonight, we're absolutely thrilled to be uh, partnering with the PKD Foundation of Canada this evening, all about polycystic kidney disease on a very fitting day uh, to kick off Kidney Month. So happy Kidney Month, everybody. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, you will be muted and your video will be off for the presentations. However, at the end, there will be a QA and a uh, session. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box for uh, Dr. Garua, Jan and Jeff, and we will do <clears throat> get to them. If we don't happen to get to all of the questions in the time that we have, uh, we can send a follow-up email to everybody with those answers as well as the recording for tonight so that you have that. And uh, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our first guest, Dr. Muita Baru. She's the Associate Director of the Hereditary Kidney Disease Clinic, Staff Nephrologist and Clinician Scientist at the University Health Network. She's an Assistant Professor at the University of Toronto and Senior Scientist at Toronto General Research Institute. Thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Thanks so much and uh, great to be here with everyone and to uh, uh, talk about polycystic kidney disease. Um, so this is the first time I'm meeting Candace and I will just say that just my, uh, just so that we're clear, uh, my name is Momita Barua, just in case anyone ever wants to look me up and ask questions in the future. So, um, so I'm going to provide uh, an overview of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease today, what I will call ADPKD from here on out. And um, in terms of how I will provide this overview, I'm going to talk about clinical characteristics in ADPKD, its genetics, how we achieve diagnosis, what's involved for monitoring, and then I will conclude uh, with talking about the pillars of treatment in ADPKD. So as the name implies, uh, one of the major features of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease are the presence of cysts in the kidneys. And the diagnosis is largely uh, based on imaging. So I show here MRI images from an individual with without polycystic kidney disease and with presumably no history of kidney disease compared to an individual who has polycystic kidney disease. And I think a majority of people will know that the kidneys are bean shaped organs that are close to the back. And you can see the outline of the kidneys quite nicely here on this MRI image. In the lower panel, I show images from an individual with polycystic kidney disease. And what you can see is that there are these innumerable um, circles, which are cysts that are fluid fill, filled that are starting to replace normal kidney parenchyma. And as um, the disease progresses, the cyst number um, or cyst size, I should say cysts grow in number or size over time. And as it advances in the most severe, uh, severe cases, you'll kind of get distortion of the outline of the kidney and it may be actually difficult to appreciate the kidney. In terms of kidney specific characteristics, um, in ADPKD, what we observe is uh, we can see blood in the urine. Um, it might be invisible or visible to the naked eye. There's also association of flank pain, uh, which is where the kidneys reside, which is the sides. And this can be due to uh, bleeding of the cysts, rupture of the cysts. It can also be due to kidney stones, which is quite common in ADPKD. You can also get urinary tract infection in ADPKD. And as with all uh, kidney conditions, you get high blood pressure. And the vast majority of individuals 
with ADPKD will get high blood pressure. And over time, this can be associated, or as the disease progresses, it can be associated with impaired kidney function or a decline in what we call the estimated glomerular filtration rate. But though the diagnostic term has the word kidney in it, you can also get, and you uh, usually get, other organ involvement. So here are a list of other clinical characteristics that are seen in ADPKD. So uh, some individuals, a minority of individuals with ADPKD can get cerebral aneurysm. You also get cysts in other organs, and the majority of people with ADPKD will get cysts in the liver. You can also get cysts in the pancreas, the spleen, and the epididymis, which can lead to uh, fertility issues. People with ADPKD can get cardiac valve disease, such as something called mitral valve prolapse. Um, also common with ADPKD is the presence of what we call colonic diverticulum. And people with ADPKD can also get uh, hernias involving the abdominal wall or inguinal hernias. The term autosomal dominant refers to the fact that this is a genetic condition. And autosomal dominant means that it's um, on what we call an autosome chromosome rather than a sex chromosome. And how that, what that means is that both males and females uh, are affected with ADPKD. There is not a sex predilection. Uh, so in this family tree here, a square represents a male individual and a circle represents a female individual. And the term dominant means that every generation is affected. Uh, and that's because an affected individual has 50% chance of passing on the uh, condition to a biologic child. So statistically speaking, about 50% of children to affected individuals will have ADPKD. Now, if you have a small family, like suppose an affected individual has only one child and that child is not affected, then that child has no uh, risk of passing on the disease to uh, their children because it does not skip individuals. In terms of its genetics, there are actually two genes that, um, in which if you get a genetic defect, uh, this leads to ADPKD. And these genes are called PKD1 and PKD2. The majority of individuals with ADPKD that are brought to specialist attention or who have gotten the diagnosis of ADPKD, vast majority of individuals have a genetic defect in PKD1. And a minority of individuals have a genetic defect in PKD2. There are a minority of individuals where after we do genetic testing, we cannot find a mutation in either of these two genes. And more recent studies have shown that there are other genes that could cause cysts in the kidneys, including these three here that I list. But even after sequencing these three genes, some individuals still remain um, negative in terms of their genetic testing. PKD1 and PKD2 associated polycystic kidney disease are completely overlapping in their clinical characteristics. They present the same, but where they vary is in severity. And this is a figure taken from a, uh, taken from a, a research article that, uh, that I was a part of uh, over 10 years ago with Dr. Pei, who's a colleague in the Hereditary Kidney Disease Clinic. And what we show here is that the average age of kidney failure is earlier in individuals with PKD1 compared to those with PKD2. And in our uh, patient population at that time, the average age of kidney failure was around 54 years for those with PKD1 genetic defects. And for individuals with PKD2 genetic defects, the average age of kidney failure was 72 years. However, some people with PKD2 genetic defects never experience kidney failure. Um, and the other thing I will mention is that this is an average age. So some individuals in each group uh, developed earlier, developed kidney failure earlier than this mean, and others um, develop kidney failure later than this mean. So under what clinical scenarios is the diagnosis of ADPKD suspected? 
the majority of individuals are screened for ADPKD because they have a positive family history. They have individuals in their family who are known to have ADPKD. But um, in individuals where there's not a known family history for whatever reason, um, it can also be suspected, for instance, in a young person who's presenting with high blood pressure, which will then prompt uh, investigations to identify what might be causing the high blood pressure, um, and that may lead to the diagnosis of ADPKD. Um, sorry, I can hear, uh, I just can hear something in the background here. Um, and it can also um, uh, be raised as an incident, what we call an incidental finding during imaging. For instance, if uh, a woman during pregnancy has imaging that reveals kidney cysts. And then finally, it may uh, be raised as part of, uh, it may uh, come up because someone is being evaluated for ADPKD specific symptoms, such as a kidney stone. The diagnosis is made based on clinical, based on imaging characteristics. So imaging, it can be ultrasound, CT, or MRI. Those imaging modalities are sufficient to make the diagnosis of ADPKD. Of course, if the diagnosis of ADPKD is considered, the clinician should also take a, uh, a detailed family history to see um, if the diagnosis makes sense in the context of the family history. Genetic testing is not required actually for the um, diagnosis of ADPKD, which as I said, can be exclusively based on imaging characteristics. But that does not mean that genetic testing is not an important part of the diagnostic algorithm uh, uh, because it can affect um, treatment options. And so genetic testing is useful, for instance, if the imaging characteristics is not classic for PKD, what we call if, if it looks atypical on imaging. But genetic testing is also important for family counseling and planning, as well as screening family members who might want to be kidney donors. Regarding family counseling and planning, as I mentioned, uh, affected individuals have a 50% chance of passing on to a biologic child. And if you are able to identify the genetic defect that's causing the disease in the family, then that raises the two options of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and prenatal diagnosis. And these are options people can pursue if they want to try to pass to if they want to try to prevent passing on the genetic defect to biologic children. So in pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, individuals who opt for this option would uh, try would uh, try to conceive through in vitro fertilization. And so you take the female partner's eggs, you take the male partner's sperm, and they create embryos in a dish by fertilizing the eggs with the sperm. They grow those embryos in the dish, and at a certain cell number stage, they can perform genetic testing on the embryos. Around 50% of the embryos will be affected, and so they will implant the embryos without the genetic defect. This, of course, is a medical procedure. Success isn't guaranteed. There are a number of um, uh, limitations to this, but it's an option that patients can consider. Another option patients can consider if the genetic defect is identified is prenatal diagnosis. This is uh, a process where the couple will uh, conceive naturally, but genetic testing can be done during pregnancy through an amniocentesis. And if the embryo is found to be affected, then um, a decision would have to be made about terminating the pregnancy or not. And then of course, uh, individuals may opt to not pursue either of these options, even if they are available to them. So now let's turn to how do we as physicians or nephrologists monitor uh, ADPKD and how do we get prognostic information? So like the diagnosis, this is based on imaging characteristics. As cysts, um, or as the kidney acquires cysts, both in number and in size over time, this leads to enlargement of the kidneys. And uh, studies have shown that 
the larger the kidneys, the higher risk for uh, reduced kidney function. And there have been um, studies that have looked to see or looked to correlate age, kidney size with kidney function. And in doing that have developed this uh, risk calculator called the Mayo classification system. Any clinician can calculate the Mayo uh, risk category using the um, kidney measurements available on CT scan or MRI. You cannot use ultrasound because ultrasound is not as accurate in uh, kidney size measurements. But using the measurements on MRI or CT scan, you can calculate the Mayo Clinic Risk Category. And the Mayo Clinic Risk Categories are from 1A to 1E, with 1A and 1B being low, lowest risk categories, and 1C being moderate risk category, 1D and E being the highest risk categories. And when we say risk category, we mean the risk of having reduced uh, kidney function over time. And I also always do regular imaging every two, three, four, five years um, uh, with ultrasound. And that's because I just want to uh, survey for other complications. For instance, there's a low risk that cysts can, um, uh, can become malignant. It's a very low risk, but um, it does exist. And so that's the reason I also do ultrasound um, regularly. And finally, to conclude, I'm going to talk about treatment, which falls under three pillars. And those pillars are of diet, aggressive blood pressure control, and for high-risk patients, those patients that fall under Mayo Clinic Risk Category 1C, D, or E, we also uh, start considering this medication called tolvaptin. So to start off, uh, we'll speak about diet, which uh, has in recent years become uh, a very um, a talked about uh, idea in management of ADPKD. But the consensus currently is that one is to recommend dietary sodium restriction, which is not just specific for ADPKD, but for all chronic kidney disease, regardless of what the cause is. And uh, the goal of uh, sodium restriction should be no more than two grams of sodium intake per day or less, which is approximately equivalent to five grams of table salt. And a dietitian consult uh, at least once during, uh, at least once is helpful, though I will tell you that um, having access to a dietitian can be challenging because there's not enough of them. Another dietary recommendation that we make is that of water drinking. So there is this hormone called vasopressin that is elevated in polycystic kidney disease. And vasopressin is, uh, has been shown to cause cysts to grow. And if you block vasopressin, it's been shown that uh, cysts, the uh, growth of cysts is slowed down. Vasopressin is a hormone that causes the kidneys to hold on to water. And so if you drink lots of water, you actually turn off vasopressin because the body or the kidney says, I don't want to hang on to all this water. I need to uh, get rid of this water by increasing urine flow rate. And it does that by turning off vasopressin. So you can turn off vasopressin by drinking lots of water. And, um, and so that is the premise for drinking lots of water to try to slow down cyst growth. Uh, and disease progression in ADPKD. This has been studied in animal models, and it has been also studied in small human studies. So here I take a figure from a paper, a relatively old paper from 2006, where they um, gave uh, rats with polycystic kidney disease, high water intake, and they looked at both male rats and female rats, and they found that rats with high water intake had, um, that their kidneys didn't grow as quickly as the rats on a normal water diet. In terms of human studies, there have been small human studies, no more than 13 uh, patients uh, on a high water diet, and um, and, and these studies did not look at outcomes like um, total kidney volume or 
uh, kidney function, but rather looked at biomarkers like something called CAMP, which also is elevated in polycystic kidney disease and is implicated in cyst growth. And so in this one study that involved 13 patients, they found that uh, high water intake, both in individuals without polycystic kidney disease and in individuals with polycystic kidney disease, did uh, suppress CAMP the circulating camp levels. My caveat to water drinking is that uh, that people do have to be careful when kidney function has declined significantly to less than in what we call an EGFR of less than 30. The second pillar of management focuses on blood pressure. This study called the HALT-PKD study demonstrated that aggressive blood pressure control was associated with slowing of ADPKD. And by aggressive blood pressure control, using a target of less than 110 over 75. And again, this, uh, this target, um, this is an aggressive target and uh, you have to be careful when the EGFR does fall. One of the limitations to using this aggressive blood pressure target is that this blood pressure target is less tolerated as people get older. And so it is a difficult target to achieve. And so an alternate target is 130 over 80. For those in the audience who've attended PKD talks before, you'll probably recognize a, a picture like this or similar pictures. And this is a picture that uh, shows the pathways in a kidney cell, what we call a kidney tubular epithelial cell, it shows the various pathways that have been shown to be uh, abnormal or dysregulated in polycystic kidney disease that causes cysts to grow. And various parts of these, or various uh, segments of these pathways have been targeted uh, and tested in animals and uh, human studies. But one medication, tolvaptin, which targets the vasopressin receptor here, uh, has been shown to be beneficial both in animal studies and in human studies, which is uh, the basis for why it's now uh, approved and used in ADPKD. There are two randomized control trials that were reported using tolvaptin, which blocks the vasopressin II receptor in ADPKD. This is the first one that was published, and there was a second one that was published that was similar, but looked at individuals with reduced kidney function, whereas this study looked at individuals with fairly normal kidney function. And uh, there was around 1,500 uh, individuals with ADPKD divided into tolvaptin-treated group and placebo-treated group. And they looked at total kidney volume over three years, and they looked at change in kidney function over three years. And what they found was that disease did progress in both uh, the tolvaptin treated arm and in the placebo, uh, placebo arm, but the uh, progression was slower in the tolvaptin treated uh, uh, group. So when they looked at change in total kidney volume, the change in total kidney volume was. Um, 2.8% uh, per year in the treated group and 5.5% per year in the um, placebo group. It, regarding kidney function decline, the change was negative 2.72 per uh, negative 2.72 mils per minute versus negative 3.7 mils per minute um, uh, per year. So the difference was small between the two groups. However, uh, you can consider it like compound interest. Even though the difference is small, over time, the difference uh, compounds to a greater effect. And people have used the results of these two studies and extrapolated the data and predict that the disease can slow by about six to nine years, um, slow to progression to the final stage of chronic kidney disease to, uh, by about six to nine years. And it is predicted that that um, uh, slowing would be even greater if the medication is started earlier. But like all medications or interventions, there are side effects associated with tolvaptin. 
The major so side effect of tovaptin is that it causes people to pee a lot. And that's because it's blocking the vasopressin receptor. And so people on tovaptin pee around four, five, six, nine liters. I have some patients who pee nine liters a day. As a result, they're also very thirsty and they're drinking lots. Um, so this side effects is prohibitive for some people to actually take the medication. And this is one of the reasons we uh, reserve tovaptin or we recommend tovaptin for individuals who are in a moderate to high risk category. And finally, um, in terms of if ADPKD does progress to kidney failure, the management of kidney failure is the same as applies to all forms of chronic kidney disease, and that is uh, in the form of kidney replacement therapy. The options are dialysis or kidney transplantation. Because there's enlargement of the kidneys, um, for dialysis, peritoneal dialysis might not be as, um, as ideal of an option or feasible as an option. Um, and, uh, but uh, it's not limiting for kidney transplantation. And in fact, um, in fact, uh, we do not routinely remove kidneys prior to kidney transplantation unless there's extenuating circumstances like the mass effect is so significant that they need to uh, uh, in order to make room for the kidney transplant. So to summarize, ADPKD is a genetic disorder. Uh, the name, as the name implies, there are kidney manifestations, but there are also manifestations involving other organs outside of the kidney. And the management focuses on diet, blood pressure control, and for high-risk patients, tovaptin. So um, with that, uh, I look forward to questions if there are any, but of course I have to acknowledge uh, the PKD Foundation of Canada, who uh, you'll hear uh, from representatives later uh, or after me uh, shortly, and as well as Dr. Pei, who I referred to, he's the director of the Hereditary Kidney Disease Clinic, and is really uh, has been uh, a leader in the field of PKD. So thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. That was uh, such a, a great presentation and, and so much wonderful information for people here tonight. So we're so grateful to have had you tonight and for you being so generous with your time. I know there's been a couple questions in our um, Q&A box, so we'll keep those to the end. Um, but thank you so much. That was so incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Look forward to answering at the end. I'll just turn yeah. off my video now. Thank you. And so up, up next, uh, as we go through this journey tonight, we have Jan Robertson, who is a longstanding PKD patient and a volunteer for the PKD Foundation of Canada. And I am very excited to introduce Jan and have her join us tonight. So Jan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome and thank you so much for sharing your journey today. We're just, we're just trying to get this sorted. It's asking her to unmute here. Okay, perfect. We'll start video. There we Jan, go. if you can, there you are. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Jan. Thank, thank you very much. It's a real honor for me tonight to be able to share my story on uh, the first day of Kidney Disease Awareness Month. And uh, I am very proud to also share that I am a... Um, polycystic kidney disease survivor and uh, having been diagnosed 43 years ago this month. It was purely by accident that I found out that I was ill. I uh, went for a procedure to a surgeon to have um, something done following the birth of my first child and before he did the procedure he gave me a physical. Upon examining my abdomen he noticed that my liver was enlarged and asked me if I'd ever had hepatitis or jaundice, to which I replied no. He really wasn't concerned because he felt that uh, the enlargement was probably due to the fact of the pregnancy, that sometimes that does happen and it can take a few months for the liver to return to the normal size. So because he wasn't concerned, he went ahead and did the procedure that day. 
A, a week later, um, I had to go back and uh, have a checkup, which I did. And at that point, he decided that maybe it would be a good idea, though, to do an ultrasound just to make sure that there wasn't any um, problems there. Um, when I went back for the results of the ultrasound, um, by the time I got to his office from the hospital, the hospital had already called him. Uh, we're in a panic because my liver and kidneys were covered in cysts as well as some of the other organs, and they had no idea what the problem was. Uh, the doctor, when I got to his office, was speechless and uh, very surprised, as was I, to learn that there was a problem because I was very healthy and young and had no idea that there was anything wrong. It was very frightening. Uh, like I said, I had a brand new baby. My husband had just been transferred uh, north of Sudbury, and we were up there all alone. Um, so I automatically, unfortunately, went to the worst case scenario because uh, that was the only thing I could think of. I had no idea about uh, kidney and liver disease. The doctor decided, um, because of these results, that he uh, should do a laparoscope. So later that summer, uh, we came back down from up north, and he did a laparoscope. And it was at that time that he informed me that he believed I had a chronic kidney illness called polycystic kidney disease. He informed me that it was fluid-filled cysts that um, were covered, covering my liver and kidneys, like I said, and some of the other organs, and that they would enlarge over time, and as would the organs enlarge over time. But other than that, I was pretty much in the dark. I was very relieved that it wasn't cancer, but I really didn't know, have any idea what lied ahead. I continued seeing this doctor for the next two years, um, but then after that, he informed me that I could no longer be his patient because he was a surgeon and surgery was not going to fix this problem. For the next several years, I went to different doctors in Richmond Hill and Toronto um, with the same um, no help. Um, no more explanation, really. Uh, I would go every three to six months. They would measure my belly and tell me that I was worse. Um, it didn't matter what I ate or drank or did, that nothing was going to help my problem or change anything for me. I remember going to a liver scan in Sunnybrook one time, and the uh, technician was really in a frenzy. And I was very concerned because I couldn't figure out what was the problem. She called a young man in and I could hear them whispering in the corner. And I heard him say to her, there's nothing wrong with the scan. It's just that her liver is so big, you can't get the whole picture on the screen. He left and she came over to me and started questioning me. How old was I? Was I married? Did I have children? How old were they? I must be so scared. What was going to happen when I was gone? And I really felt that that was one of the worst days um, of the whole 43 years of my journey. It was so difficult. And I believed at that point that I wasn't even going to live long enough to get to the parking lot. At this point, after that experience, I knew something had to change. I had two small children at home by this point, and I was bound and determined that I was going to be around to see them grow up. So I had to fight. I had to fight hard, and I had to develop a positive attitude to make that happen. In March 1994, I was at home one afternoon, and I received a phone call. It was a gentleman asking if my name was Jan Robertson, and did I have PKD? After I caught my breath and asked him who he was, I learned that he was a, also a PKD patient and had got my name from the PKD Foundation in the US. He asked me if I would like to meet. I was ecstatic because I had never been able to find another living soul who had this, and I just couldn't wait for this to happen. We met off and on for a couple of years, and then the um, Polycystic Kidney Research Society of Canada was born. We wanted to start a foundation that would help other PKD patients in uh, Ontario or the surrounding area so that they wouldn't feel alone like I had for so many years and that we could start um, getting help and encouraging other patients to join us so that we could all have a future 
um, as a family and do wonderful things together with the help of um, some special doctors. I also learned from this gentleman that there was a Dr. Janet Roscoe who specialized in PKD. I could not believe that there was a doctor um, and that none of the doctors that I had been going to had told me about her. At my first meeting, she could not believe the condition I was in and that the doctors had let me get to that point. We spent two glorious hours with her that first afternoon, and we learned more about PKD than we had in the 15 years previously. She explained everything. She was so kind and gentle and knew that something had to change. On my second uh, appointment with her, she referred me to Dr. Gary Levy at Toronto General Hospital. And within two months, I was in to see him and he informed me that I needed to have a transplant sooner than later because I did not have uh, a limited amount. I did have a, a limited amount of time left. I asked him if I was his wife or daughter, would he recommend that I go on the list right away or could I wait a little while? Because this was another shock that uh, I had no idea was coming. But he said he felt that I needed to go on the list right away. Um, I was number 70 on the list, and he told me I would probably have the transplant within a year. Fast forward to two and a half years is when I actually got the transplant. So it was a good thing I went on the list when I did. The, uh, the uh, meeting with her um, like I said, was absolutely incredible. And as far as I'm concerned, she's one of the doctors, first doctors that helped save my life. And along with her and Dr. Levy and Dr. Lilly at Toronto General Hospital, um, I have learned that it's so important to have uh, doctors that you can talk to, you can listen to, that they're there for you, and that um, that's the most important thing in the world. Uh, Toronto General has become like a second home to me, and I feel so loved and safe there and cared for, and that's so important. After all the years of not having that, I tell everybody that I talk to that you need to find that doctor. And PKD is such a special disease and a unique disease, and that is very important. And in my uh, own immediate family, my case was so severe Yet, my mom was diagnosed years after I was, and she passed away last year at the age of 98 and never had one single day's problem with PKD. Her mom also died at the incredible age of 98 and had the occasional UTI and some high blood pressure, but other than that, nothing. Her mom passed away in her late 80s and they said it was cirrhosis of the liver, but we do not believe that that was the case. I think she had PLD and they just felt that her liver was enlarged and automatically uh, diagnosed her with cirrhosis. 11 years ago on September 28th, uh, we found out that um, both of my children did not inherit the gene, even though as Dr. Barua said, they had a 50-50 50, uh, 50, 50 chance each of getting it. The, at our walk, uh, two days before we found out, the t-shirts read that day, PKD stops with me. And little did we know how true that was gonna be. My first miracle ended up happening on April 25th, 1998. And as I've said a few times before, my life changed overnight. It was just incredible. I uh, was able to do things physically I had never done in years and years. I was able to get a whole new wardrobe going from a size 20 down to a size six because of my humongous liver. And it was the first time in probably 20, 25 years that I did not have to answer the question of when my baby was due every single day. I did amazingly for 10 years. We were planning a 10-year um, celebration of my transplant. And then again, things changed overnight. And within four months, I had one day to live. There ended up being a complication with the donor bile duct. And at uh, one point, they had hoped that a doctor at St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto was going to be able to repair it. He was only one of two doctors in Canada that could do this procedure. 
But when I woke up, he was standing there with tears in his eyes and told me that he couldn't help me. And my only hope was going to Toronto, back to Toronto General. He had already called them and that there was uh, a team waiting there for me in Emerge. When we got there, there was four transplant doctors. They escorted me up to the transplant floor and we um, were informed that I would be going immediately on the list. I really didn't need hardly any of the tests because I'd had so many done trying to figure out what the problem was. So I jokingly said to them that I had hoped that I could have the next transplant um, on April 25th, again, on my 10 year anniversary. And they said, no, 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 that's not gonna happen. Uh, it'll be long after that. But little did any of us know how badly things were gonna go downhill quickly. And so on March 30th, uh, 2008, I ended up receiving my second gift of life. It was uh, very different this time because um, just before the transplant, I couldn't walk, I couldn't eat. So the recovery was much different. Uh, however, it didn't matter because I was still here. It's been uh, 15 years this month um, that I will celebrate my second transplant. And my liver is very, very happy. Um, the kidneys, though, not so much. Uh, 25 years of anti-rejection medication and the PKD uh, declining in my kidneys. I am only functioning now at just above 20%. So I've been told that probably in the next couple of years or sooner, because I tend to do things quickly sometimes, that I uh, will probably have the kidney transplant. But like they say, there are times of charm. And I'm very excited this time because I'll be able to have a living donor finally um, that I can share the rest of my life with. So I'm very excited about that. I had reached out many times to my two previous donor families, but I never heard back from them. But I know that they know how I feel. And I think about them every single day. I had heard about a gentleman whose son passed away and he um, could not go and visit the families, but he carried the letter around in his wallet and read it every single day. So I'm hoping that that's what my situation is. Our immediate family has experienced organ donation an unbelievable five times, with our last donation being a year and a half ago when my daughter-in-law donated a piece of her liver to her father in London. So needless to say, organ donation is very near and dear to our hearts. And anytime we can or anywhere we can, we advocate for the miracle that it is. I love all my PKD family and my transplant family, and I cannot imagine my life any other way now. All those years of feeling so alone is so long gone. And we are now a huge, loving, caring, wonderful family and charity, and so much progress has been made in the last 15 years that it just warms my heart. And that's thanks to Jeff and Kara, our incredible board, and all our amazing families and, and volunteers. I was asked once when I spoke at a symposium what my hopes and dreams are. My hope is that we will continue to work together to find the cure to end PKD. And my dream is that it'll happen in my lifetime and then my PKD journey will be complete. Keep fighting, keep strong, and never give up. Thank you. Wow, Jan. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us and uh, being so, so vulnerable um, with what you've been through. It's uh, remarkable always to hear from people within um, this this world. Um, I often say it's a, it's a family that I wouldn't wish on other people, but I'm very grateful to have this transplant family and, you know, this incredible group of people who are inspiring and, and provide us with so much hope. So thank you for being that light today and, and sharing. That's my pleasure. And now I'd like to turn it over to Jeff, who is the executive director of the PKD Foundation of Canada to give us some closing remarks and tell us a little bit about the PK, PKD Foundation. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Candice. Hope everyone can hear me okay. 
Uh, I've been in this role uh, as the executive director for the PKB Foundation of Canada for um, coming on 15 years. Uh, and that's the first time I've had the pleasure of uh, presenting at the same time as my mom. So that was very exciting for me. Um, I'll uh, be able to blast through this slide uh, tonight. Usually I talk about uh, my family's journey, but we heard it in long form uh, from my mom this evening. Uh, she's been through uh, quite a lot and has been an absolute inspiration uh, through it all. Um, on the other side of her there uh, is my Grams, uh, who, as my mom said, uh, passed away uh, last summer, um, but lived a incredible life um, with polycystic kidney disease and was, uh, was uh, a beacon of hope for those um, with PKD. Uh, to know that you could live a long and healthy life uh, with this uh, diagnosis as well. Uh, the mission of the PKD Foundation of Canada is to promote programs of research, advocacy, education, support and awareness in order to discover treatments and eventual cure for polycystic kidney disease and to improve the lives uh, of all that it affects. Our vision is that no one suffers the full effects of PKD. Uh, over the years, as my mom mentioned, uh, we were the Polycystic Kidney Disease Research Society, uh, a provincial nonprofit organization helping those in Ontario with polycystic kidney disease uh, through the years of 1994 through uh, 2009. Uh, in 2009, I stepped in as the executive director. Uh, we rebranded and incorporated as a national nonprofit charity. Uh, and became the PKD Foundation of Canada. Uh, we knew um, early on the services and uh, opportunities that we were providing those in the PKD community uh, in Ontario was something that um, everyone across uh, the country needed. Um, and we've been very fortunate to see that growth over uh, the last number of years as we've uh, expanded our look and had the rebrand there in 2016. Uh, we are a small but mighty organization. Um, from a staff standpoint, uh, there are two of us, uh, myself and my colleague, Kira Johnson. Um, and we are a board of five uh, with everyone on the board, uh, either being personally affected by polycystic kidney disease or having a loved one uh, living with PKD. Uh, we have local chapters uh, across Canada. Uh, a great chunk of those uh, are here in the Southern Ontario area where I reside. Um, our local chapters uh, focus on four key areas, which is of course education, support, awareness, and advocacy, uh, as well as fundraising. Uh, they serve as the uh, PKD Foundation of Canada uh, representatives on a local level um, and make sure to always uh, raise awareness uh, for polycystic kidney disease um, and help to educate those in the local communities. Our signature fundraising event is the Walk to End PKD uh, that's held in the fall every year. Uh, we just celebrated our uh, record setting uh, campaign this past September, uh, where we raised over $200,000 uh, for critical Canadian PKD research. Um, these are opportunities across Canada to um, come together as a community, uh, to recognize that you're not alone, uh, as Jen emphasized earlier, um, and to celebrate um, the community and uh, those of us that are working towards uh, finding advanced treatment options for polycystic kidney disease. Uh, over the years, since 2007, um, we have been uh, able to raise over $2 million from this campaign, um, which is something we're all very proud of uh, being a grassroots organization. Uh, if you haven't checked it out already, I do encourage you to visit our website. Uh, it's a fully bilingual website. You can visit either ndpkd.ca or fini la mpr. Uh, all of our resources that are, are on both sites um, are there to educate people who are newly diagnosed, as well as those that are further along in their PKD journey. 
Um, there is a ton of uh, information um, up there, as I mentioned. Uh, all of our webinars, including this evening's, are hosted on our website um, for you to view at a later date. Um, there is a, an opportunity to join our uh, email list. Um, we send out monthly newsletters um, that are uh, that serve as a great point of contact for everything happening in the PKD community. As uh, we've mentioned a couple times, uh, March is National Kidney Month. Um, and right now we are in full swing um, of one of our uh, larger social media campaigns, the 31 Days of PKD Challenges. So if you uh, aren't following us on social media, um, my final slide will um, provide all of the handles. Um, come join us online, uh, join in the discussion about polycystic kidney disease um, and take the 31 Days Challenge. Um, every day uh, we, we provide either a task or a, an opportunity to raise awareness for polycystic kidney disease, um, signing up for our newsletters, sharing your story, um, sharing facts or changing your profile picture, uh, little things that we can all do uh, to elevate uh, the visibility of PKD during National Kidney Month in March. Uh, a few of our programs that I would just want to highlight quickly. Um, we have recently partnered with the Transplant Ambassadors Program. Uh, TAP is a wonderful organization uh, that started out here in Ontario, but is starting to expand um, in different uh, provinces across Canada. They serve as uh, ambassadors for those who are either looking to speak to someone uh, who has had a kidney transplant or who has donated a kidney uh, to a loved one or um, a stranger. So if anyone on this call or watching this video at a later date um, is uh, in the midst of looking for a kidney um, or is looking to speak to someone who has donated a kidney, um, reach out to the foundation. Um, all of the contact information for our partnership with TAP is on npkd.ca um, and we'll pair you up um, with a mentor that will be able to talk to you about their journey um, and provide some uh, firsthand uh, information that will be uh, invaluable to you on your journeys. Uh, the Having Your Living Donor Find You is a campaign that we partnered with Harvey uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, Harvey has made some terrific vignette uh, short videos uh, that teach you how to um, design your own uh, social media campaign um, to find your living donor. So if you or a loved one is uh, are considering um, putting out a social media campaign and need to learn how to talk to people about that, how to make that ask, uh, the do's and don'ts of successful campaigns, uh, visit our website and sign up for the Having Your Living Donor Find You uh, program. Uh, the videos are very well received. Um, a lot of successful um, transplant candidates found their um, their donors through Harvey's work, um, and we're very thankful um, to Harvey and uh, this campaign um, for being able to provide that added support to our members here in Canada. The Voices of PKD uh, is something that we send out in, on a monthly basis as part of our uh, monthly e-newsletter, as well as our social media posts. Um, it's an opportunity for uh, PKD patients or loved ones to share their journey with the public. Um, it's a great opportunity to highlight um, the, the challenges one has faced, um, the journeys that they are on, uh, the hurdles that they've uh, overcome. Uh, while living with polycystic kidney disease. Um, they're all up on our website, uh, so check them out. Um, and if you are interested in sharing your story, um, there's also an opportunity uh, to submit your voice um, to join um, this campaign. Uh, one of the resources that's on our website is uh, the Refer PKD uh, that came out of uh, Dr. Jordan Weinstein's You Kidney. Um, if you visit npkd.ca slash refer PKD, uh, there is an interactive tool that helps you track uh, the closest PKD specialty clinic to you uh, and also provides you um, with uh, information about the clinic, the wait time, uh, the referral process to share with your doctor. 
um, and is a great tool, again, as I mentioned, uh, to help you find uh, local support systems in the medical community in your area. This is just a snapshot of uh, what the platform looks like. So you'll see here, there's the search engine. You can either look by the clinic, uh, the destination, uh, or the doctor's name, and uh, everything will auto-populate for you. Uh, some milestones that I'll just go through uh, rather quickly, and then of course, we'll be uh, opening up the floor to the Q&A. Uh, we have, over the last number of years, became uh, the national leader of clinical research and fellowship funding in the field of polycystic kidney disease. Uh, Health Canada recognizes September 4th as National PKD Awareness Day. Uh, this has been in place now since 2015. Um, it's a great opportunity um, to, again, raise uh, the visibility of polycystic kidney disease, what it's like to live with polycystic kidney disease, um, and to um, show the, the support in the local communities um, for those affected by PKD. These uh, next couple slides are just a glimpse of uh, the level of support that we've been able to garner for PKD Awareness Day. These are all the local representatives, mayors, and councillors uh, from all of the cities and towns that recognize PKD Awareness Day, uh, in addition to Health Canada's recognition. Uh, on top of the proclamations, um, we also have a, a large number of flag raising ceremonies across Canada, as well as uh, monument lighting ceremonies um, to again uh, draw attention to PKD uh, and to recognize the support uh, for those affected by PKD. Um, on this screen uh, are some, some absolute beauties. Uh, the CN Tower um, was an absolute sight to see uh, the first year that it was lit up teal for polycystic kidney disease. Um, in the center there is the Calgary Tower, um, and then the big one, uh, Niagara Falls, being lit teal um, on the evening of September 4th. Um, a lot of these uh, monuments have uh, live streams. The Falls is one that you can uh, log on uh, to their website and check out and watch it from uh, the comfort of your home, wherever you are. Um, and it's really, really neat to see. So uh, if you haven't uh, checked it out, um, I encourage you to do so uh, this September 4th. Um, we host in a uh, pre-pandemic world, we were hosting in-person uh, symposiums and chapter educational meetings uh, across Canada. Um, we have obviously, through the pandemic, pivoted to virtual educational opportunities uh, like this evening's event. Um, we are reintroducing in-person uh, meetings throughout uh, the year in a safe manner, um, but we will always now um, provide these opportunities in a virtual platform as well. Uh, so there will be uh, equal access for those that can either join us in person or prefer uh, to watch from home, then you have that opportunity as well. Uh, we work very closely with uh, the media to get stories of PKD out to the masses, to educate the general public, um, the key decision makers, um, and government stakeholders. Um, these are just some of the stories that we've had uh, shared across um, Canadian media over the years. Uh, National Post has been a big supporter of the PKD community. Uh, CTV, uh, the National Post. Um, there in the center is uh, one of our coordinators, uh, Luisa Miniacci from uh, Montreal with Dr. Alam, uh, a PKD specialist and uh, strong supporter of the PKD Foundation of Canada, uh, being interviewed on Global Montreal. And these are just opportunities, again, to, uh, to share one story or what's happening in uh, the world of research related to PKD and to help the general public uh, better understand what it's like to live with uh, this disease. 
So if you aren't following us uh, on social media already, I encourage you to do so. It's a really fun month uh, online for us with the 31 days of PKD challenges. Uh, all of this information is on our website as well. Again, that's endpkd.ca. Uh, so do stay connected. Uh, we have educational webinars uh, being planned for uh, all throughout the year. Um, and it's a great way to stay connected with the local community as well. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll throw back to Candice now, um, and we'll tackle some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was some great information. And uh, again, if anybody wants to reach out, um, definitely take a look at their social media the next few days as well, because there's going to be some fantastic activity going on. So I'm going to uh, go to our Q&A here now. And uh, some of these questions um, were answered a little bit uh, throughout your presentation, Dr. Rua, but we have quite a few in here. Um, and before I ask the question, I just wanted to also share a couple of the comments in here for Jan. So thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you, I'm struggling with PKD and PLD as well, and you give me hope. Jan, you are amazing and a true warrior. I wish you all the best. I'm always thinking of you. So thank you for sharing your story today, Jan, because it's very powerful for everyone to be able to hear. Um, so back to you, uh, Dr. Barua. I'm going to ask you our first question here. Um, you answered this a little bit about when children should be tested for, for PKD, um, about how you can even test embryos now. I'm wondering if um, you want to discuss that a little bit. And we're going to unmute you first here. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. You'd think I would know how to how to manage this by now. Um, so um, uh, the thing about testing in embryos is more for if you're trying to uh, trying to explore options to prevent passing it on to biologic children. We would not recommend doing that just simply to know that early. Um, and in terms of um, when to screen children, there's I don't I, I don't feel like there's a right or wrong answer to this. Um, but we don't the guidelines don't recommend using tovaptin in individuals less than 18 years of age. So that's kind of the guide I use that I say uh, screen children at eight, around age 18, uh, because that might at that point change management if you do the imaging and you do the risk stratification. Um, my only caveat is that, which is not medically related really, but is that when you start doing tests and you get diagnoses in the medical chart, um, this can also pose a barrier to insurance uh, for insurance uh, purposes. So if someone's trying to get life insurance, disability is more difficult to get when you're younger because you don't have your occupation set by that, like usually at that time. But, um, but I do talk to patients about if they're in a position to, for their children, potentially exploring life insurance um, before um, screening children. Um, and, in, in that theme, one thing is that genetic testing, there is a law in Canada currently, but laws can change as we saw like with the abortion law, for instance, in the state, there is a law currently that um, insurance companies and employers cannot use genetic information uh, in a discriminatory fashion, uh, but that does not apply to just other medical investiga other investigations. So that's the only caveat that I would say um, to that question. But in general, if you're not considering that at all, I would say 18 is a good time. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And you also mentioned uh, tol tolvaptin. Um, there was a question here. Can you speak to any studies or your experience on the side effects for patients in their 20s and 30s? Um, so we use tolvaptin quite a bit because our practice is centered on individuals with hereditary kidney disease and polycystic kidney disease is the commonest one. Um, so in my experience, I haven't noticed that there's a difference in side effects in younger individuals versus older individuals. Um, I can't speak to if it's more tolerated in a 
different it, compared, like if you compare ages, I can't speak to that. Uh, I have people across all decades of life on tolvaptin. Um, with all medications I prescribe, there are like the usual side effects that you see. But then I always have patients that tell me about side effects that I'm not used to seeing. And they say, I'm convinced that this is related to this medication. And I can't say that it's not, but it's just not one of the common ones. Um, the commonest side effect for tovaptin that patients will talk about the most is the fact that they're peeing a lot. And some people are able to uh, tolerate that in their life, uh, in their life, integrate into their life. Some of it has to do with lifestyle, like what type of job they have, if they're like, in a car all day as part of their work, they might not be able to integrate it into their life uh, as opposed to someone who's working from home now. Right. Um, so, um, but I don't notice a difference in side effects uh, in a younger population compared to an older population. Okay, fantastic. Candice, if I can just interject for a moment, uh, if anyone uh, watching this or uh, participating in the Zoom uh, this evening is interested in connecting with um, uh, PKD patients that are on Genarc or Tolvaptin, um, certainly reach out to the PKD Foundation of Canada, uh, very similar to uh, the TAP ambassadors. Uh, we have individuals that can speak to their journey um, on Genarc and Tolvaptin, and we do our best, of course, to pair you with someone um, from a similar lifestyle, so you can add actually hear from um, someone whose life is uh, has been changed uh, through this therapy. Wow, that's fantastic. And I, I can't echo enough the importance of peer support. You've heard it tonight from, from us, but um, it, it's very impactful. It's a lot different to pick up the phone and have somebody say to you, I understand, and they actually do understand. So I would encourage anyone who's on this call tonight uh, who would like to talk to somebody to reach out to the PKD Foundation, reach out to the Transplant Ambassador Program, reach out to the Centre. All of these places we can provide you with connections with people who have been through this because it's incredibly important to be able to speak to somebody who has been there where you are as well. Yeah. Um, so I've got another one here for you. Um, does all ADPK1 turn into kidney failure or are there cases where it really doesn't affect the individual throughout their life? Mm, so I saw this question and then I did, and when you're reading this now, I realized they're asking about PK, uh, PKD1 um, because I was going to answer and say that uh, not all PKD2, uh, not all, all people with PKD2 experience kidney failure. There are, uh, PKD1 is more severe, but there are people that don't experience kidney failure. But um, in my experience, it's rare. I'm trying to think of a study that, I'm trying to think of a study that has looked at this, but I, I can't think of one. Mm -hmm. um, but there, like everything, there's always exceptions. So. Um, but if you have PKD, you need to, uh, regardless of whether or not your disease is severe enough to go on to kidney failure, you should be seen by a nephrologist for monitoring because things can change over time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. And I think we've, we we're a little bit over time, but, um, there's been a couple questions. I'll ask you one more. Um, there's been a couple questions about, um, protein and uh, potassium, all of that dietary information. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about dietary protein or consumption of red meat, um, as well as potassium. I know those are two very different things, but how those affect the progression of PK. So uh, I'll start with potassium. It's easier for me to answer. Um, so in terms of potassium, when... Um, when the kidneys don't, when you start to lose kidney function, when the EGFR declines, then the kidneys can't get rid of potassium as well. So the potassium rises in the blood. So for people with PKD, if their EGFR is starting to decline, that might become an issue and they have to restrict potassium. But it doesn't have anything to do with potassium restriction helps slow down progression of uh, PKD. There has been um, interest in understanding 
uh, dietary interventions to see if it can slow down progression. And, uh, and that's what I uh, mentioned very quickly in my presentation, that really the only things that has consensus amongst PKD experts is salt restriction, which is not specific to ADPKD, and water drinking. But other uh, interventions like protein restriction, intermittent fasting, key, uh, uh, key, um, uh, uh, keto diet, those have not been uh, supported by human studies, uh, meaning that they haven't been done yet or published. Um, of course, human studies that have been done and don't show a, a difference may not be published, but uh, there might be some animal data that suggests benefit, but um, animal data do does animal studies do have limitations. There have been other examples of animal studies in PKD uh, that has not been supported by human studies. And so we can't take animal data to uh, to uh, guide our clinical advice, but animal data is the foundation for human studies. So there are human studies looking at various aspects of diet, but for now, we can only say salt restriction and water drinking. Okay. And most of us uh, who go through the, the kidney clinics, if not all of us, are connected with a dietitian. Um, and so these are some really great questions too that, you know, next time you're in your clinic visit, you can bring up with your renal dietitian. Um, they may have some pamphlets with for you all about uh, potassium and uh, meat and things like that. I know I got a giant booklet of unfortunately, things that you shouldn't eat and things that you can eat. And I will I will end with saying my all-time favorite thing that happened post-transplant was I ate chili for about two weeks because pretty much everything in chili is not a great diet for a dialysis patient. So that was my favorite thing was to make giant batches of chili with the beans and the tomatoes and the salt and the, and the beef. So I really enjoyed that post-transplant, one of the tiny joys that, uh, that you're allowed post-transplant. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely the diet when your EGFR has fallen is restrictive. And um, that's why a transplant is a great, uh, uh, is, liberates you from, from that amongst other, other things. Uh, and for, there are also options with dialysis that can also like home dialysis options that can also help liberate, um, you know, lifestyle and diet as well. Fantastic. Well, there are some other questions, um, but I know we are stuck for time here. So what we can do is we can follow up with people as well um, post presentation because we want to be respectful with everyone's time. I want to say a very large thank you to you, Dr. Barua, to Jan and Jeff for your incredible information, your knowledge, and your support tonight. Um, anyone who is interested, please reach out to either the center. You can reach us out, uh, reach out to us through the Eventbrite link that you registered in, or the emails I've been sending you. And please definitely connect with Jeff, um, PKD Foundation, because there are amazing people just like Jan out there sharing their journey uh, that you can help through this process. So um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are gr very grateful and we will post this video up on our channels as well for you. So thank you so much. Happy Kidney Month and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.